Mummies or not mummies? It's a tricky one, isn't it? <laughs> it's not tricky at all. This is a mummy. No, not those ones, Clive. British mummies. You've got more dead bodies than a serial killer. <laughs> we sink into the mysterious world of the Bronze Age dead. Bog to the future, if you like. To understand if British mummies were a real thing. How long would it take to smoke a Clive Anderson-sized oh. human? And making some unusual discoveries along the way. So it's been like being preserved in red wine or tea? I'd say tea. <laughs> <laughs> As we try to solve the mystery of Britain's ancient mummies. Bog to the future. And now that's quality work. The British Isles have a very long history. People have been living here for tens of thousands of years. And the further back you go, the more elusive and mysterious the lives of those ancient Britons appear to be. Stonehenge, what's the point? It's a bit like Lego. Oh. Who were these ancient Britons? What did they believe? What was their world like? Are you a fan of human sacrifice? I don't practice it myself. As a talk show host, I should know how to ask a good question. Where are we going to, Marianne? Clive, we are off on an adventure. But answers are not really my strong suit. Well, are they zombies or not? It is a bit baffling. The yeah. evidence is not clear. So I've roped in someone with more insight into the ancient world than I'll ever have. Anthropologist Mary Ann Ohota. Old bones, Old looking at the past, you know everything, don't you? I like to ask a lot of questions about the past. Ooh. Together, we're going to unlock the mystic secrets of the ancient Britons. I've decided to harness the forces of evil. Prepare to embrace the very odd indeed. Right, I'm ready for all comers. Hello. Now, you may be wondering why I'm standing around in the British countryside clutching smoked salmon and beef jerky. And quite frankly, uh, so am I. Uh, but it's all in the interests of understanding mummification. Now, these are modern foodstuffs preserved using ancient practices of uh, smoking, uh, drying and salting. But there's a theory that ancient Britons used those very same practices to preserve their dead, their human dead. Well, it's a startling proposition, mummies in Britain. But is it true? Well, frankly, I don't really know. So I'm off in search of somebody who does. All I know is that when it comes to mummies, ancient Egypt is the gold standard. So before we set off on what frankly sounds like an unlikely search for British mummies, I'm going to have a look at the competition. A proper Egyptian mummy. Tucked away inside this rather spectacular building in Oxford is the Pitt Rivers Museum. It's really one of the weirdest and most wonderful museums I've ever visited. There are crystal balls and toy cars, poison-tipped arrows and AK-47s, and all manner of bizarre and beautiful objects from around the world. But this is what I've come to see the mummy of a young woman called Erterau. She died over two and a half thousand years ago in Egypt, where the mummies come from. Well, this is what I call a mummy. It's a real body, wrapped up and preserved, and if you take the wrapping away, you could still see the flesh on the bones. There's a human toe. Leathery, maybe, but you're looking at the actual, the skin of the toe. This is definitely a mummy. Real skin, still there after thousands of years. Could the ancient Britons really have made something like this? I mean, where would they have put them? I'm no expert, but I'm pretty confident Bronze Age Britain wasn't blessed with an excess of pyramids. I think you underestimate the ancient Britons, Clive and I know just the place to prove it. I'm heading to West Kennet Long Barrow in Wiltshire, a thousand years before the first pyramid was even a twinkle in a pharaoh's eye, 
ancient Britons were already building monumental places like this for their dead. At 328 feet long, this barrow is a substantial piece of sturdy British engineering. And it gives us an amazing insight into how important their ancestors were to the ancient Brits, which is ultimately one of the motivations for mummification. Professor Josh Pollard from the University of Southampton is my guide on our journey into this eerie underworld. It feels a little bit spooky, even though it's pretty accessible. It is like going into a different world. A portal to the other side. It is. It must have been even spookier for the archaeologists who first excavated the tomb in 1859, because it was filled with human bones. What likely happened is that newly dead individuals were brought into the tomb. They were being placed on the floors of the chambers, but then they were left to rot, to turn into piles of bones without being covered in any way. And then when they'd bring in a, a new body, they would sometimes quite carefully push aside the bones of previous burials. So the end result is that you get this mixture of collections of bones, some fresh bodies, other bodies that were partially decomposed. You say it would have smelled awful with that process of decay. It would probably be a very frightening place as well. It feels like it's got a special atmosphere even now with yes. my 21st century rational science head on. That's right. I'm, I still feel like I need to whisper. So far, so spooky. But when archaeologists counted the bones, well, let's just say things didn't add up. We don't have enough skulls to go with the, the long bones that are present here. So there's too many bodies for the number of heads? Yes, that's right, <laughs> that's right. So some bones are being taken out and they're perhaps being kept and circulated as ancestral relics oh, amongst wow. the living. It's hard to imagine taking great Auntie Edna's skull for a day out. And we'll never know for sure if that kind of thing went on here. But evidence from other cultures suggests it's a possibility. While not exactly mummification, today people in La Paz in Bolivia bring out the skulls of their loved ones once a year to honour them and even give them a beer and a cigarette. To many of us, the idea of touching and spending time with the dead might seem strange, but clearly it isn't to some. And it wasn't to the ancient Britons who built West Kennet. Oh, it gives me goose pimples to think of, of people coming in here, I don't know, chanting with smoking herbs and carrying flaming torches, yes. and then having to rootle through semi-decomposed corpses looking for the special skull that they need to carry on with the ceremony outside. Yes. To get back to the point, I admit that if you're rooting through rotting corpses, you aren't really practising mummification yet. Because the sort of mummies we're after are ones where the flesh has been deliberately preserved after death. But what Wes Kennett tells us is that five and a half thousand years ago, way before the pyramids, Britons had already begun a complex spiritual relationship with the bodies of their dead. It's not such a big jump from that to making mummies. And there's evidence that people's desire to keep the dead with the living continued in later generations. Because just down the road from West Cannet, archaeologists discovered one of the strangest ancient British burials ever found, the bones of a girl, strung together like a puppet. To find out more about it, Marianne has sent me here, 30 miles south of West Kennet, to the rolling downs of Dorset. You can't swing a cat around these parts without bumping into some of Britain's oldest and most mystic monuments. Many of them date to the Bronze Age, beginning about four and a half thousand years ago, around the same time as the Egyptian pyramids. Unlike the Egyptians, ancient Britons didn't leave any written record. But fortunately, they did like a good burial mound. And these lumps and bumps can tell us plenty about how they lived and died. 
Unfortunately, like many burial mounds, the one I'm looking for has been plowed away, leaving little more than a circle in the soil hidden beneath a field of turnips. A very faint hint, uh, to spot it, you need years of training as an archaeologist or X-ray vision, or at least the power to see through turnips. Sadly, they don't teach you any of that at law school. We've got a faint hint of a crop mark. Yeah. Can you see there's a slight arc of uh, thicker vegetation there? I can, but I think I can see that all over this field. <laughs> Martin Green doesn't have X-ray vision, but he is an archaeologist, and his family own these fields, so he knows this land like the back of his hand. He assures me that tucked away in the turnips, just in front of me, is the burial mound of a Bronze Age British mummy. And I can also see a slight raised area of turnips growing there, which... As that wasn't just an extra handful of fertiliser. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no. <laughs> So we can... Uh, Frankly, I'm struggling to see anything. Maybe this film should be about turnips. Anticipating my somewhat limited powers of observation, Martin has come prepared to mark out the location of the mound. Well, to help you, Clive, I'll put in a few of these uh, flags here. Well, thank you very much. Looks like a, a rather poorly laid out uh, crazy golf course, but it, <laughs> it gives us some idea. And so I find myself tiptoeing through the turnips, surrounded by small blue flags. It doesn't look like much now, or indeed anything at all, to be honest, unless you're a fan of root vegetables. But in 2009, on this very spot, Martin excavated what could be one of the strangest pieces of evidence of mummification in the whole country. Who or what was, was buried <laughs> in this, this mound? Well, this is an um, adolescent female, and uh, when the bones were being cleaned after we'd taken them out of the grave, there's some very unusual aspects of them. So what were these unusual aspects? And what have they got to do with mummification? Because, let's face it, she looks nothing like a mummy. Rather disturbingly, Martin tells me the girl's skeleton is stored back at his house. Suddenly, the turnip field doesn't sound so bad. Fortunately, it's not in his living room, but in a museum he's set up for the things found around the farm. Oh, wow. Oh, it's a proper... Well, it's a museum, as, as you said. There are thousands of flints, the skulls of ancient giant cows, and all manner of pots, teeth and ancient bits and bobs. And here's another skeleton. Yeah. You've got more dead bodies than a serial killer. <laughs> but this is the body I'm interested in, the teenage girl found in the turnip field. And here's why. This is where we discovered the drill hole here, this femur that you can mm. see. The end of her leg bones have holes in them. Martin believes these were man-made, gouged out using razor-sharp flint tools. Yeah, you can see very clear. Yeah. Fortunately, yeah. after her death. We did some scanning electron microscope work on here and CAT scanning, mm. and you could see the actual way it had been drilled with a, with a tool yeah. in this kind of motion. Right. There are drilled holes in both her legs and her left arm. Martin suspects that as the girl's body started to decompose, someone tried to stop it falling apart, stringing it together like a kind of human puppet. So you've got a hole in that end of that bone, and there's another hole in that bone there. Yes, that's right. Which suggests yeah. you could link the two together. Mm. Mm. Presumably, you either use a little, um, uh, uh, yes, a bone point or yeah. a stick, or possibly you might even use some kind of sinew uh, right. uh, uh, as a form of string. That, that kind of thing, obviously, yeah. we're never going to be able to say for yeah. sure, but it's tempting to think that that is the kind of thing they were doing. Yeah, yeah. I can hear a dog barking in the background. <laughs> Maybe all this talk of bones has excited <laughs> the canine population. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. The rover is barking up the wrong tree because there isn't a scrap of meat left on these bones. And that makes it hard to know if this macabre marionette was once a proper mummy. But it suggests, at the very least, rudimentary efforts to preserve a dead body. Because, presumably, the point of all this drilling was to keep the corpse intact. I wonder how much effort it would actually have taken to drill these holes. Presuming, of course, that DIY shops were a bit thin on the ground during the Bronze Age. 
Luckily for me, archaeologist Gabrielle Delbar is boring. Not personally, of course. Personally, she's fascinating. But Gabrielle is boring experimentally with prehistoric flint tools found on the farm. Martin Green has been uh, napping uh, borers. Yes. And uh, here uh, we have uh, some uh, pig bones. Well, we're sure these are pig bones and not human bones. That we... uh, absolutely yeah, certain. Yeah, okay, because I'm sure there must be uh, absolutely some sort sure. of broadcasting human. directive on, on <laughs> using human bones. No, so, so, um, so what... that looked like. You want me to put a hole in that end, like in that? In that end, yeah. Yeah, in there, OK, yeah, right. In here. And, uh, With my choice of borer. Well, your choice, yes, why not? Um, well, that looks like a nice one, doesn't okay. it? OK. And if you want to do the 360 completely on just one side? That's what I should be doing. Yes, yeah. It's a fairly sharp uh, flint. Mm -hmm. And I just bore away. Yes. I can bore away for ancient Britain. Yes. <laughs> Maybe don't have it. Oh, I see. So this is like screwing sure, it like in. like that, yes. It's making a nice crunchy sound, which I hope is the bone rather than the flint. Oh, it's, it's going to stay there, isn't it? See, the trouble is, if I then fell over and died, mm -hmm. 3,000 years later, Martin would come along and say, ah, oh, this shows that ancient Britons like to make things with a, with a stone <laughs> in the end. They were creating a little, you know, model human with a bone and a head. Yes. That's what we'd conclude, wouldn't we? Because we wouldn't know any different. Mm -hmm. Oh, 360. Yeah. There we are, and it has made a hole. So did you yeah. find it easy to do? I did, actually. I found it easier than I was fearing. OK, so what my extremely low-tech demonstration has shown is that making a marionette skeleton in the Bronze Age would have been relatively straightforward. Was that part of a more complex mummification process? Frustratingly, we may never know, because at some point her body was buried and the flesh decomposed in the damp Dorset soil. But there might be even more to this body than you think, Clive. I know how much you like your Egyptian mummies. So you'll be pleased to hear that this body shares an uncanny similarity with a proper Egyptian mummy. This man died 2,600 years ago. But when archaeologists x-rayed his body, they found something shocking. A nine-inch metal pin in his knee. Analysis revealed the pin was inserted after death to keep his body in one piece. Is that what happened to our girl's body? Was she mummified? Did she once look like this? The similarity is certainly very striking. And attempts to preserve the dead in the Bronze Age seem to have been surprisingly widespread in Britain. 600 miles from Martin's farm, just north of Inverness, a team of experts are carefully making their way down a 100-foot-high cliff to one of the most mystic archaeological sites in Britain, Cowsey. A steep descent, slippery rocks and high tides make this a treacherous place. It can only be accessed safely by highly trained archaeologists, led by site co-director Lindsay Buster. We're cut off now for about four hours, either side of high tide. It's a major effort to get here safely. But 3,000 years ago, when health and safety laws were a bit more lax, the evidence suggests that Bronze Age people made this hazardous journey time and time again, carrying the bodies of their dead. For prehistoric people to, to make the effort and to make the journey would have been really arduous and quite a difficult thing to do. Lindsay thinks they did it because, to them, there was something about this place that gave it mystical, perhaps even magical, properties. Now we're standing in quite an open, quite a well-lit, quite a well-ventilated space. But we need to bear in mind that that might not have been the case in prehistory when these funerary activities were taking place. This stretch of coastline is quite changeable, erosion processes, bits of cave roof fall in, and actually what we have today is probably an entrance which is much wider and much more open than we would have had in prehistory. So it's highly likely that the cave in prehistory would have felt smaller, darker, more enclosed, and a more special and ritualised place. In all of the areas that we've excavated in this cave, we found concentrations of human bone. We've even excavated right at the far back of the cave in the dark recesses, and we've got human bone over there as well. 
These bones were unique, unlike anything found in Britain before. These are pictures of um, hand bones, and what you can see here is soft tissue, it's ligaments, and the same on this, this, this one here, that little, that little bit there, that's soft tissue. It may only be scraps, but don't be fooled. This is preserved human flesh, dating to the Bronze Age. Our first reaction was disbelief that bones of this age in dry land conditions, not waterlogged conditions, but dry land conditions, could actually preserve soft tissue like this. It was only with scanning electron microscope images um, analysed back at the lab that we were able to confirm that it was indeed soft tissue that we had, and disbelief, really, that the preservational conditions in this cave were allowing for that to happen. It's not something that we expect when we're excavating a site that's 3,000 years old. That's a really significant find. It's possible that this bone was once part of an entire fully fleshed corpse, a body preserved by the unique conditions at Cowsey. But there's no way to be certain. Remember Clive's preserved meat and fish? Well, Lindsay thinks that the salty sea air and cool temperatures inside the caves could have created something similar, out of human flesh. I think the unique preservational qualities of the Cowsey Caves really come down to a number of combined factors. They're caves, for a start, so they have very stable temperature and humidity all year round. That's very good for preserving archaeological deposits. But what's also specific about these caves is they're made of sandstone, very sandy, very dry deposits, and the salty sea air. Everything's really being air dried, um, and the salt is really critical to that. Um, you can see here, actually, we've got um, an animal bone covered in salt crystals. And I think it's the salt, the combination of the salty sea air, the sandy geology of the caves, and the, the stable humidity and temperature, which is really contributing to the unique preservational factors we're finding at these sites. It's even possible that bodies placed in the caves were smoked as well. We have evidence of fires being lit within the cave at the same time, presumably, as bodies are being laid out here. The smoke could actually probably have helped to preserve bodies and body parts. Bodies preserved by smoking and salting. It sounds a lot like mummification. But did people come here deliberately to make mummies? Lindsay suspects they did. Whether or not the preserving characteristics of the cave were known before bodies were brought into here in later prehistory, we don't know, but certainly once bodies began to be brought into the cave and were behaving in ways that they, they didn't normally do on above ground sites, I think those characteristics were probably well noted and became very, very significant parts of the funerary process. Just like at West Kennet, returning to Cowsey's remote caves generation after generation suggests the ancient Britons had an important relationship with the bodies of their ancestors. I feel very privileged to work on this set of sites. Um, they're really giving us a glimpse into quite close interactions between the living and the dead in prehistoric Britain. Um, very special, very intimate relationships, and I feel very privileged to get a, a glimpse of that today. Um, we often think about um, elaborate funerary rites taking place in far-flung exotic places, Egypt, South America. But actually, here on the Murray Firth, on the northeast coast of Scotland, amongst very average communities going about their daily business, living very average, ordinary lives, we're getting to see actually some really, really special archaeology. Obviously, it's a little different from the ancient Egyptians who prepared their dead for the afterlife in fancy pyramids and elaborate tombs. But Lindsay and her team believed that the individuals whose bodies ended up in the cave were specifically chosen, perhaps to honour them. What it says to me is actually that what we're looking at here is quite intimate interaction with de dead bodies, that um, living individuals are perhaps processing the bodies of their friends and their relatives to aid that transition between 
uh, a living a living body, a living individual, to the world of communal ancestor. Maybe the dead could intercede with the gods on behalf of the living. Sadly, they didn't get around to inventing writing, so it's impossible to know. But we've now got evidence that the flesh of the dead was preserved. And archaeologists suspect it was intentional. Marianne seems convinced, but all I'll admit to is some intriguing evidence that ancient Britons might have intentionally preserved their dead. There's a macabre marionette in deepest Dorset, and the salty Scottish sea cave. But were they mummies? All that's left from the cave are tiny fragments of flesh. I'm not convinced that salt, smoke and sea air could really have preserved a body. One that looks like a proper Egyptian mummy. So, Marianne, can you really preserve an entire human body that way? To find out, I have come here to Fish Island in East London. It's about as far away from Cowsey and the Bronze Age as you can get. Remarkably, this area is home to experts in flesh preservation. Not human flesh, of course. The answer to our ancient mummy's quest is fish. Lance Foreman is a fourth-generation salmon smoker. The business was started back in 1905 by my great-granddad. Fresh salmon normally starts to go off within hours of being caught. But treat it, and a piece of salmon flesh can last for years. The first and most important ingredient in the preservation process is salt. No shortage of that at Cowsey. There we go. Basically, what you want to do is just sprinkle it lightly on the, the fillets, um, more towards the head end where the fish is thick, not so much on the tail end. Right, OK. But, uh, sort of give like, it a go. Yeah, just push it. Exactly. What is it that the salt does to the flesh? Well, the salt essentially draws the moisture out of the flesh, and it's the water where all the bacterial activity takes place. So by removing that, you're stopping the fish rotting. So putting this salt on makes it a hostile environment for all the microbes, the bugs, so it can't decompose? Correct. So this could be effectively what was happening in that cave near Inverness. I would imagine that is what would be happening, yeah. It's quite fun. Wait, too much? No, that's, like that's good. Away? Yeah, salt that's good. happy? That's good. To be honest, you can't really over-salt them, because once they've absorbed a certain amount, you know, they, they won't... They, you know, they'll get saturated, so they won't absorb too much That's more. good to know. You can't over-salt it, it's fine. After 24 hours in salt, the salmon has dried out and is ready for the high-tech smoking chamber which they obviously didn't have in the Bronze Age. Cowsey's equivalent would have been a smoke-filled cave. In fact, before we even smoke it, we air-dry it to take out even more moisture. And that's also just like Cowsey, except there it happened naturally. The sea air would have helped dry the bodies. OK, let's start smoking. I can see it coming in now. Ah, oh, there we go. Inside the chamber, a fine mist of smoke particles coats the salmon. After 24 hours, it creates a barrier thick enough to prevent bacteria from getting into the flesh and causing decay. How long would it take, then, to smoke a human? Perhaps, indeed, a, a Clive Anderson-sized oh. human? Well, it depends on how smoky you want uh, Clive to be, of course. <laughs> um, but. You know, it shouldn't take that much longer because the smoke is really there just to coat the outside of the body, um, or the salmon fillets in this case. So, you know, how big's Clive? Clive's about ten salmons, maybe? Yeah, maybe yeah, ten salmons. Yeah, about ten salmons. Ten, so, twelve, so, yeah. I don't know, maybe a couple of days, a couple of days. Oh, right, yeah. so not long then. No, not that long, really. To preserve him and to intensify his flavour. Yeah, I think he'd enjoy it. <laughs> This was the East European way of doing it, you know, salting the fish and then smoking it. The Scandinavians used to just bury the salmon in salt and they produce a product you've probably heard of called Gravidlax. If you yeah. think of the roots of the word grav, grave, to bury, lax was salmon. So they buried the salmon in salt and that's how they preserved it. They never then went to the next stage of smoking it as well. 
grave salmon. Grave salmon, yeah. Love that. Yeah. Obviously, we're not following the Swedish system here. But I think what we can say for certain is that using Lance's technique on a presenter, the salt and air would make Clive's flesh inhospitable to any bacteria that would already be present. And the smoke would stop new bacteria from getting in. Just like the scrap of flesh at Cowsey, with enough salt, air and smoke, theoretically, we could preserve Clive for years. I'm not sure I like where this is going. I think I'm already pretty well preserved, thank you very much. I know Lance is confident he could treat a body like a smoked fish, although preferably not mine. Luckily for me, Bronze Age people may have had other ways of preserving things. I've been dispatched by Marianne to a bog in Ireland, where I'm told some very special things have been taken out of the ground and I'm slowly sinking into it. Archaeologists have found plenty of evidence that bogs were spiritually important in the Bronze Age. People have discovered weapons, jewellery, and many other precious items in bogs just like this. But as I gently subside into this soggy landscape, it's hard to believe that ancient people came to places like this seeking contact with the supernatural. Not exactly Stonehenge, is it? Well, this certainly, certainly looks like a bog. And if you stake one foot out of place, you sink down into it and you're never found again. You're gone. Local artist Connor Lane scours the ground around here for pieces of oak thousands of years old that have been perfectly preserved in the peaty soil. And he uses it to create some impressive pieces of art. He's become something of an expert in the preserving power of bogs. The heather and the ferns, the mosses, yeah. lichens, all produce a very gentle acid. Yeah. And it's this acid that reacts with the bog oak yeah. that perfectly preserves it. It actually goes down about 30 feet yeah. deeper here. As the heather on top of the bog sinks underwater, it dies. But the lack of oxygen stops it from decaying completely. This process creates a slightly acidic soil known as peat. And the perfect conditions for preserving pretty much anything. What have you found in there? Don't say you found a, God, no. a, de a dead body. You know, it no, looks, it was an insect. It looks like moth or something. All right. The peat is formed layer by layer over thousands of years. So the deeper you dig, the older those things are. There might be a 3,000-year-old moth. It could, Who it could be, it could be. <laughs> it's um, ruined somebody's clothes 3,000 <laughs> years ago. The preservative qualities of the bog is a similar process to tanning an animal skin. So it's a bit like being preserved in, in red wine or tea, uh, whichever choice you go for in, in preserve. What would you go for as a preservative? I'd, I'd say tea. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll opt for the wine. A full-bodied burgundy, perhaps. Connor finds his perfectly preserved pieces of oak relatively easily. So it's entirely possible that Bronze Age people knew about the preservative powers of bogs like this. But could it preserve human bodies as well as wood? Well, the answer to that question can be found here at the British Museum in London. I've been given special permission to visit After Dark with archaeologist Eamon Kelly. Let's hope nothing comes alive. We're bypassing the museum's famous Egyptian mummies to visit something altogether stranger, and to be honest, less attractive. The slightly squished, rather tanned body of a man who died around 2,000 years ago. Not in Egypt, but in Cheshire, in the northwest of England. So why is he in this state? Well, he was found in a bog in the northwest of England, Lindo yeah. Moss. He was found in, in the course of peat cutting operations. Yeah. The peat cutting machine sliced the man's body in two, 
But what remains is extraordinary. He died around 2,000 years ago, but I can still see his toenails, hair follicles, even the stubble on his chin. Now this is what I call a mummy. He even has a name, Lindau Man, after Lindau Moss, the bog where he was found. This is fantastically preserved, considering how long uh, we're talking 2,000 years. What is it about the bog that preserves human flesh? What preserved the bodies, essentially, is the sphagnum moss, which is in the bog. It produces a chemical which converts human flesh and skin to leather. OK. And you can see... He's got a leathery quality you, you to have, his skin You now. have a leathery quality. Yeah. This man is one of hundreds of preserved ancient bodies found in bogs across northern Europe. Many of them died violent deaths, including the man in front of me. He was certainly struck on the head, which yeah. was probably the first of the injuries, which would have knocked him unconscious. It didn't kill him outright. Right. There is a garrote around his neck, and his neck has been broken. Right. So he's been banged on the head and garroted. That's enough to kill him, I suppose, either that of those eventually. That certainly killed him, yeah. yeah. Eamon believes these men and women were ritually killed as sacrifices to the gods, and that could explain why their bodies were put in bogs. The interesting thing is that Lindau Moss is on a very important tribal boundary. All right. It's still a parish boundary to, yes. to, to this day, and the boundary areas were where these ritual killings took place. Yes because boundaries, and particularly boundary bogs, provided access to the other world. Right. So a ritual performed at such a location right. would be deemed to be more effective. How fitting for a mystic ritual. A wet, muddy bog is Britain's answer to Egypt's pyramids. But was using a bog simply part of their belief system, or did they also know that bogs preserved bodies? And that might be part of the reason why they did it, to, to make an offering to the gods and, and hope that that meant the offering hung around. Bog to the future, if you like. Or was it just an accident? <laughs> Bog to the future, now that's, that's quality work. Bog bodies really do look promising as genuine British mummies. But in my book, a mummy is only a mummy if it's been intentionally and not accidentally preserved. And that's the heart of the matter. Bog bodies are only mummies if ancient people actually understood the bog's preservative properties. Marianne still needs to convince me about the power of the bog. The thing about bogs is that they're weird, watery places that are partly land, partly yeah. wet. They're, you know, liminal. They're on the edges. You don't quite know what side of the thing you're on. And so it seems like, to me, quite a good place to, you know, liaise and, and intermingle with the, the, the spirits or the gods or, or whatnot. It's the beauty of the bog. Yeah. Do you buy the idea that the human bodies were put into the bog in order to preserve them. It does, as it turns out, preserve the body. And I suppose if we know that, then there's every reason to think that ancient peoples would have worked that out as well. They were doing really odd stuff, and you get glimpses of it. Yeah. And then you have to go, well, what on earth were they doing that for? Why were they yeah. smoking people in remote caves off the coast of Inverness Shire? I find it quite uh, intriguing and delightful. You've got snippets, you've got clues and you can be quite imaginative as to how you interpret it. No, I like to use the power of my imagination as much as the next man. But in the end, the debate about British mummies needs some good, solid proof that ancient Britons did intentionally mummify their dead. And right now, it's all a bit, well, circumstantial. So far, all the evidence we've got is a, well, a handful of bones, some scraps of sinew, to close the case, we really need some solid evidence that the mummification was deliberate. Now, to get this, Marianne has gone off to an exotic location for us, Sheffield. Sheffield, Clive, is the answer to our prayers, because the university is home to some of the most exciting Bronze Age skeletons ever found in Britain. 
In 2001, two unusual skeletons were unearthed beneath the remains of a Bronze Age roundhouse on the small Scottish island of South Uist. Archaeologist Tom Booth has been studying them for the last nine years. So there was lots of little bits of evidence that suggested that there was something strange about these skeletons, uh, besides them being buried underneath a house. Uh, they were buried in a very tightly flexed position, so the knees were drawn right up to the chest. And uh, the, a flexed burial is quite normal for this period. Most people are buried with their knees drawn up rather than... Sort of in this curled, like, fetal position, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah, uh, rather than extended. But uh, these bodies were completely in anatomical order. So clearly these bodies had been fleshed, otherwise they would have been pushed out of order. Look at the tiny toe and finger bones, all in exactly the correct anatomical positions. These bodies must have been buried with their flesh still on. Exactly what you'd expect from any normal burial, right? But radiocarbon dating shows these bodies were buried 300 to 500 years after they died, still with their skin on, which means, unequivocally, their flesh had been preserved. And your theory? Uh, we think that the, the body had been uh, mummified. British mummies? Uh, yes. From prehistory, people yes. in Britain were mummifying their dead? Yes. British mummies. Told you so, Clive. In fact, these are very similar to the mummies found in Peru. Their legs are also bent close to their bodies, and their skin and soft tissue are still intact. OK, so these bodies were mummified, preserved after death. Question is, how did Bronze Age people on a tiny Scottish island pull it off? To find out, Tom and his team began by taking CT scans showing the inside of the bones. So this is what we would expect from someone who, say, died yesterday. So this is slices as if you're sort of zooming through the length of the bone and you can see inside it. Exactly. And it, it's quite solid, isn't it? All this white stuff is hard sort of bone tissue. Exactly. This is fresh bone. Now look at the difference on this scan. This is the kind of bone you'd normally find on an archaeological dig. It's grey and full of holes, because over time, bacteria have eaten the inside of the bone away. But the bones from South Uist, that have been in the ground for about 3,000 years, look as though they were buried yesterday. You get this. <gasps> it's, it's got really distinct layers, hasn't it? This bit here is the, the solid bone like a fresh bone and these little bands of greyish, fuzzy fizz, that's the only bit that the bacteria have got to. That's the only bit they've eaten away. Exactly. So what this suggests is that something happened to the body which stopped the bacteria from attacking the bone. This is the secret of intentional mummification, preventing decay. Do we have an idea of how this body was preserved? analysis of the chemical structure of the bone suggested that the bone had been exposed to an acidic environment. And the nearest environment at that time that would have been acidic would have been um, some nearby peat bogs. Look at the bones. They have that distinctive tanned orangey colour that Clive saw on the bog body in the British Museum. Experimental work suggested that it would take probably about six months or so of submersion in a bog for the soft tissue to preserve. And then they would come back and collect a preserved body. And that is what makes this so very special. These are unlike any other bog bodies in Europe. Those were probably sacrifices left there permanently for the gods. The bodies at South Uist were removed from the bog once their tissues and bone were preserved. Then they were kept above ground for hundreds of years. We don't know why people were chosen to be mummified in this way. Were they on display? Were they kept in a Bronze Age mausoleum or with the family? Frustratingly, with no written records, we'll never know for sure. 
Thanks to being buried eventually in our miserable climate, the preserved flesh is now gone. But one thing's not in doubt. These were once mummies, proper British mummies, deliberately preserved. The Egyptians had it easy. The dry desert air desiccated the bodies, making mummification a cinch. Cold, damp Britain was, let's face it, a bit more of a challenge. But that didn't stop Bronze Age Britons trying to stay connected to their ancestors. It is a very British mummification. In your face, Tutankhamun. So if I were from Bronze Age Britain, I would probably, instead of being buried under a tree and, you know, someone putting some flowers down, what I actually want you to do is put me in a bog, take me out after a little bit, then pass me around for a, a few generations, well, up to about 500 years, and then you're allowed to bury me. That's the best that you could hope for, I think. Sounds great. <laughs> These astonishing Scottish skeletons seem pretty conclusive. Bronze Age Britons did intentionally preserve their predecessors. Not to hide them out of sight like the ancient Egyptians, but to keep their ancestors around, possibly for centuries. With the help of smoke, salty sea caves and bogs. How very British. I think the modern ways of disposing of dead bodies are quite sterile. Mm. I'm all for being excarnated and then, you know, having my limbs reassembled. I'm making a note of that, so, so it can be done. So do you want to be preserved as a skeleton or do you want your skin to be preserved as well, like a I bog know. body? I reckon I, I, could, I could be a skeleton with a few bits of sinew, maybe. Like, sat on a throne with my little claw fingers. Fucking I'd like to okay. be preserved, mummified, mummify oh, me. OK. All the way. I'm not sure I'm going to be the decision-maker when the time of your death comes. Clive, I'm counting on you. <laughs> I'm unlikely How to be... How about you? I'm what unlikely do you, to be there. Do, do you want to be mummified? I, I don't think I want to be mummified. I think I'd like to be buried in the, in the, in the ground, in the, in the countryside. And then dug up? And I don't... And as long as they leave it a decent interval, you know, a couple of thousand years, after that, you can ding me up and say, oh, look, it's an odd set of his shoulders. I wonder if that means he used to carry huge weights in the course of his laborious work. You know, let them speculate. But don't do it too quickly, cos I think it's disrespectful. Yeah, yeah. OK. Yeah. I don't mind. The animals can eat me. Oh, right. Oh, you, you're, you're changing your mind on this. So. No, well, just... So you want your body exposed on a hillside for the, for the various animals, foxes, dogs, crows? The thing is, I have a dog. Don't feed me to my own dog, that would yeah. be weird. You'll be just a lump of old bonios. <laughs> <laughs>